From the inception of Cambridge Green to its period of occupation to its eventual demolition, a series of structurally racist public policy decisions and practices led to the gentrification of Cabrini Green. Structural racism is a result of social, economic, and political systems. It is defined as public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms that work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate a racial group in equity. Structural racism has been mobilized through public policy practices to steer African American public housing inhabitants. Since the inception of Cabrini Green, public policy decisions and practices have facilitated structural racism within the projects. The 1937 Housing Act was passed on September 1, 1937. As a result of the 1937 Housing Act, the Chicago Housing Authority was formed. The Chicago Housing Authority received subsidies to build public housing for low-income citizens. The Chicago Housing Authority used these funds to develop public housing units in an area that was already known for being a slum. This area where the Cabrini Green housing projects would soon be developed was nicknamed Death Corner. There was even a book written about the area in 1929 called The Gold Coast and the Slum. In 1942, the first of multiple housing complexes were built. The Francis Cabrini Homes consisted of 55 two- and three-story buildings. These housing units were originally built for low-income citizens working in the nearby industrial factories. Another housing act was passed in 1949, which gave the Chicago Housing Authority necessary monetary aid to build additional public housing units. In 1958, the Cabrini Green extension was completed. The extension consisted of inexpensive and architecturally flawed high-rise buildings. The extension consisted of 1,921 units, which were primarily occupied by low-income African-American citizens. In 1962, yet another high-rise building, known as the William Green Homes, opened up to residents. The building consisted of 1,099 units. During this time period, the African-American population in Chicago nearly doubled, and the quota of African-Americans allowed to reside in Cambrini Green was abandoned. The Cabrini Green projects were isolated and occupied by poor African American citizens. The Cabrini Green projects were surrounded by two affluent white neighborhoods known as the Gold Coast and Lincoln Park. Residents of these affluent neighborhoods remained socially and culturally segregated from Cabrini Green. Housing policies such as the 1937 Housing Act were enablers of structural racism. And they contributed to the eventual downfall of Cabrini Green. When the Chicago Housing Authority received federal funding for Cabrini Green public housing developments, the plan was to build an ethnically balanced community. The Chicago Housing Authority's inability to keep Cabrini Green ethnically balanced is an example of public policy practices that led to the downfall and gentrification of Cabrini Green. Federal government subsidies that the Chicago Housing Authority received through housing acts to build public housing were monetarily deficient. Local organizations that built public housing did so for as cheap as possible. Cheap housing and the inability to maintain public housing exemplifies structural racism 
because the low-income African Americans that occupied Cabrini Green's public housing units could not afford to maintain standard living conditions. In his book, Blueprint for Disaster, D. Bradford Hunt argues that the poor needed good housing not only for reasons of public health, but for the social stability of the city. The idealistic vision behind the 1937 Housing Act was unattainable. The Chicago Housing Authority failed to provide good housing for the poor. A large majority of the tenants were low-income African-American single mothers who had little money to pay for the necessary maintenance of their public housing buildings. Poorly maintained high-rise buildings in an abnormally high youth population created a haven for gang and crime activity in Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green became notoriously known for crime and gang activity. The Cabrini Green projects grabbed national headlines for crimes such as the murder of two police officers in 1970 who were sniped from the high-rise buildings. In 1992, the HOPE 6 plan was enacted by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. The goal of the program was to revitalize the worst public housing projects in the U.S. into mixed income developments. Cabrini Green was a target of the program. The HOPE 6 program is another example of a public policy where decisions and practices facilitated structural racism and helped lead to the gentrification and redevelopment of Cabrini Green. The program's design marginalized low-income African Americans within the Cabrini Green community. In his article, Cabrini Green to Parkside of Old Town, Lawrence Vale argues that the city leaders aim to replace the poor with the less poor and to purge the very poorest. It has been the role of design and designers to signal that this large-scale social engineering has been accomplished. Residents and community activists fought back against the program. They held rallies and hired lawyers to legally battle against the public authority advocating for redevelopment. Residents and lawyers had some success throughout the legal battle, but according to Lawrence Vale, Cabrini residents were marginalized in a later version of the plan prepared by the now U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Redevelopment Managed Authority. An in-depth report on a struggle for every major city, how to house its poor. Cabrini Green in Chicago is probably the best known name for the worst in public housing. At its peak, 15,000 low-income tenants lived in its high-rises. And this week, the final residents moved out as part of what the city of Chicago calls a transformation. The plan for transformation was implemented in 2000 and was the largest, most ambitious redevelopment effort of public housing in the United States. It was defined as an amb ambitious plan that called for the demolition of notorious high-rise developments, the comprehensive rehabilitation of all other scattered site, senior and lower density family properties, and the construction of new mixed income, mixed finance developments. The guiding principle behind the plan is the comprehensive integration of low income families into the larger physical, social, and economic fabric of the city. The CHA aimed to renovate or build 25,000 units with a focus on units for families with mixed income developments and also aimed to rehabilitate 9,000 units for senior citizens. The term mixed income developments was the CHA's way to disguise the relocation of the very poor. Few of the original Cabrini Green residents would be able to afford these units forcing them to other high-rise projects in the south and west sides of Chicago and away from the wealthy and white neighborhoods of Lincoln Park and the Gold Coast. They've wanted to demolish Cabrini for a long time, uh, in part because it could be easily redeveloped. From the Housing Authority's perspective, they wanted 
to get rid of these eyesores. One original policy in the plan for transformation was that residents were granted a right of return, initially locking them in a spot in the new renovated housing. By 2008, eight years since the start of the plan, a large number of the very low-income families were forced to remain on the waiting list while living in temporary makeshift public housing, with more than 1,000 unoccupied senior units sitting vacant. The only explanation given by the CHA was that cost and lack of land were the reasons for continuing to keep low-income families in limbo for more than eight years after being asked to leave Cabrini. Most of the households who do gain residence in the mixed-income communities will not be the original families with the right of return vouchers, therefore breaking the CHA's promise to its original residents. Housing that's affordable for, uh, for people that are currently still living in the Cabrini area um, the old towers and whatnot, it, it, it's hard to come by. At the same time, though, if you take a look at the buildings, what's left there, I mean, there's, they just can't stay in, in their current state. The plan only intended for 7,000 of the 25,000 units to be located in mixed income housing developments, specifically Cabrini Green, which was formerly a low income development. Therefore, according to Vail, the small number of residents that will be granted access to the mixed income communities they formerly lived in is not a failure of the plan for transformation, but rather the premise of the plan for transformation. Another implemented policy was the way officials chose locations for construction of public housing. For an area to be selected to build, it had to be considered a revitalizing area defined by the CHA as an area which contains a substantial minority population but is undergoing sufficient redevelopment to indicate the area will become more economically integrated in a relatively short period of time. This broad and unclear definition of proper relocation areas allows the CHA to place a vast majority of Cabrini residents in other slums on the south and west sides a policy which directly removed the low-income black population from the near north area. Many residents complain that the focus of the plan never should have been to create mixed-income areas when there are so few residents that can afford to live in them. According to Patillo, the vision for mixed-income redevelopment was developed in private meetings in Chicago between largely private developers, financial inter intermediates, and lawyers. The CAC, a body of representatives from each public housing development, was systematically excluded in the initial goal setting and the development of the plan. The decision to build mixed income units in the Cabrini Green area of Chicago contributed to the gentrification of public housing neighborhoods and to the displacement of, rather than the empowerment, of former residents. What happens to people who are forced out of projects like Chicago's Cabrini Green. You drop them in an area like Inglewood or the northern part of the city or further south, people are pretty much put into an area that they have no connection with. And it's either um, they're just forced to fend for themselves yeah. with no support system whatsoever. The crime spread out of, around the city. Uh, Inglewood, particularly, is one of the areas that's hardest hit because of the influx of public housing residents. According to Chicago police, when the Cabrini residents were relocated to other slum sites, further densifying the population of poor black youth, with little to no job opportunities, gang activity, drug dealing, and prostitution increased in the south and west sides of Chicago. Fast forwarding to present day, these are now the highest crime rates out of the entire city. Chicago has one of the longest histories of gang violence. Uh, it's basically the place that invented gangs. It's the most segregated city in America. It's basically it's a perfect breeding ground for like anger, resentment, and violence. What you're witnessing is like someone trying to break out of a cage almost. Yeah. But there's like a lot going on here and it's only happening here. Plan for Transformation also implemented a work policy mentioned earlier. Starting in 2008, the CHA made it a requirement that residents who were not disabled or senior citizens had to work 15 hours a week and provide proof of a job. The 2008 downturn of the economy made this regulation even more achievable, further gentrifying the community. 
and they look at it as just a bag. That's it. They'll look at you. If you're in the building, they either think you're selling drugs, you're holding a gun, or you're running from the police or doing one of them. And that ain't the truth. You know what I'm saying? Some people got to realize it's not that easy for us to get jobs. So therefore, we, we reserve the, you know what I'm saying, going in the building doing what we got to do. It may not be a good thing, but that's the way we're supporting our family. For those who are able to use vouchers for the private housing market face structural racism also. Residents of whom had been public housing their entire life were now faced with locating and securing a property with no prior knowledge of the private housing market. The CHA offered a limited number of counselors whose job it was to aid in this process. According to Vail, many of these counselors only brought families to other poor segregated neighborhoods and heavily populated by other voucher users because the counselors had close relationships with the landlords in these areas. These firms received commission based solely on completed placement, having no regard for location or condition. Vail states that almost all of the rental units were in financially depressed and racially segregated areas on the west and south sides of Chicago, further stating that there is an established pattern of the vast majority of rentals being in the two racially segregated areas on the south and west sides of Chicago, containing a high percentage of families who are below the poverty line. From the inception of Cabrini Green, through its occupation, to its eventual demolition, the 1937 Housing Act, the HOPE 6 program, and finally the Plan for Transformation facilitated the gentrification of the low-income black population from the near north area to the impoverished south and west sides of the city.